All right, that being said, uh, we're going to be in a few different places this morning. We'll first be in Proverbs 4.23, and then we'll jump to James 4.4, 4, and then 1 John. But let's pray. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us and help us as we come through the Scripture this morning. This is one of those messages that's got a dual purpose. It is a form of a warning, which is so important for us to receive in the Word of God. Uh, but it's also a great revelation of how much God loves us, listen to this, in spite of us. And that's always impressive, that God loves us, we the broken ones of his, that are his children. But he's going to direct us this morning. He's going to ask us to look in the mirror. And this is a good thing sometimes, right? We never go out of the house without looking at ourselves. How many people go out of the house without looking at themselves? Anybody? I don't put permission. Oh, she's just, but she's naturally beautiful, so she can do that. Uh, but most people look at themselves before they go out. They got to check their hair. Look, see, notice I didn't, I didn't check my hair before I came in here. You can look uh, a little bit. But it's good to self-examine ourselves, uh, spiritually speaking. And so God's going to lead us to do that this morning. So uh, let me give you, go ahead and give you the title, and then we'll pray. The Journey from Disloyalty to Devoted. The journey from disloyalty to devoted. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for what you've already done in our church this morning in Revere to see so many people come out. Thank you for what you're doing there in that location to, to grow a community of believers. Thank you so much, Lord, for the reward of patience and trusting in you. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to draw others into the kingdom there and, and also here in Seabrook, Lord, that that this community would recognize where the truth of the word of God is being preached. Who we seek to glorify is you and not ourselves. And so I pray, Father, that you would light, shine that light so brightly in this community that others would come and find this church, ultimately finding you and finding the truth they need for life. Father, we pray you would do that and we patiently wait on you. But bless those who are here this morning. Finish the work you've begun in them. Have your way in each one of our hearts, my included. Father, would you forgive us for our sins? Cleanse us, Father, through and through so that we might be washed and, and there'd be no obstruction from the free will and the free power of the truth of the word of God flowing through us through the Holy Spirit. Let him have his way this morning as you speak. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many people remember playing tug of war as a child? Tug of war. That is uh, something I did um, when I was part of a youth group um, uh, a couple of times. I did that in my secular friendships as well. You know what it's all about, right? There's a rope. You, you have a dividing line. You tie a rag. And uh, there's that, that, usually that obstacle in the middle. Sometimes it was water. Sometimes it was mud. I played one time with mud in the middle. That made it really fun. Uh, but you have two teams, uh, and you, you obviously have, if you have six, you have six on the other side. If you have ten, you have ten on the other side. And uh, it really uh, takes the team that's most persistent and most determined to win. It, it usually can go and get into a stalemate. I remember one time we played, and it was pretty, the teams were pretty evenly matched. So as a result, we were in, a, in just like this long, perpetual, uh, stagnant state in which no one was winning and losing. And uh, it just, it took the team that would persevere the longest to find victory. And eventually, one team gave in. And all it took was usually one or two people on one side of that team to start to let go. And pretty much that team couldn't hold it any, hold the line any longer. And they would give in. And uh, what we would note, if we were losing, uh, I'd, I'd give the signal like, okay, let's all of you let go at the same time. Right? And we know what that meant. That meant that whoosh, the other team was going to go flying. And it's like, if you're going to win, you're going to pay for it. And uh, so, so we're familiar with what a uh, tug of war is. Um, now I want you to think of your own wants and desires. And let's sp speak about a spiritual tug of war. Team one is my will and what I want in my flesh outside of God. Team two is God's will and what he wants for me. And I want you to recognize that that spiritual tug of war is, is present in most lives. I'll be honest with you. I don't know uh, 
whether people realize it, I think that's a place to start this morning is some people don't realize there's a spiritual tug of war. If you're in a relationship with God today, Satan is on one of those teams. He's on the side of the flesh, on the side of your will being done, not God's will. It's a spiritual battle, a battle between flesh and spirit that goes on within the life of a Christian. And it's one that we should be cognizant of. We need to be recognized that this is spiritual war going on. Now what scares me and what concerns me is that some people don't even realize that war is going on. And sometimes that's because the war has already been won on the flesh side. Going through the motions of faith, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church, check, check, check. I hit a Bible study once in a while, spiritual giant that I am. I pray, such wonderful prayers, and I'm going through the motions. And yet, if I look at my life on the outside, and then if God's looking at my life on the inside, there's a clear war that's been won on the side of the flesh. And how is that known? It's by the extent of what's at the priority in your life. For some people, their career can take over. Their financial security can take over. Their lustful desires can take over. Their comfort can take over. We sang this morning about God being our comfort and God being our shelter. Sometimes we seek comfort in the things of the world. Amen? I mean, it happens. We've all been there. Comfort can be found in, in our insecurities in the, world, in the way that the world saw, uh, finds comfort. And I can go through a myriad of ways. Some people find comfort in alcohol. Some people find comfort in, in, uh, in, in food. Some people find comfort in lust. Some people find comfort in self-sufficiency. But the, the Christian life is, is meant and designed to be dependent on who? God. God designed us to be dependent on our Father, we being his what? Children. And it's important for us to recognize this spiritual tug of war going on within our lives today. And I think that's where God has, has put us this morning in the scripture. I was reminded as I was driving up here, and I don't ever do this, but I'm driving, and I said, I'm going to forget this. So I, I, I kind of drove and made a quick note and closed my Bible because I didn't want to forget. God reminded me that, and we're going to see it in the scripture this morning indirectly, love is patient. Love is patient. And I think about how patient God is with our, listen to this, adulterous life. You know the Bible calls us adulterers? I love how Jesus helped the, deci- the, 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 the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the day, and he helped define what adultery is. Adultery in its, in its most deadly physical form is s- sexual relations outside of the marriage bed, the marriage relationship. Having sex with with someone other than your spouse. But Jesus said, and and I'm reminded of it uh, in the scriptures this morning, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after, after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, if some of the men and even the ladies want to be honest with themselves, I, pretty much everyone in this place is an adulterer of some form. Because all it took was a lustful look. Whether for a second, a half a second, defining, defining it by the Jesus standard, to look at someone with a lustful intent outside of the marriage covenant is adultery. It's a divided heart. It's a divided allegiance. It's a divided loyalty where we're looking to something else in our lives to satisfy us, to help us be where and what and how we want to be. When the Bible's very explicit that we're supposed to give God what? The preeminence. What's that mean? First place. Did you know God is jealous for you? Not jealous of you. He's jealous for you. God is not interested in a fling. God is not interested in being second place. And yet, if we took an inventory of our lives and someone was to watch us from afar, or perhaps a movie was played of our life of our average week, 
would they see God first place hour by hour, day by day, minute by minute in our lives? Are we dependent on him? Are we looking to other things to satisfy and guide and direct our lives and compromise in our lives? Now the truth of the matter is, I think for many of us we're guilty, certainly guilty, of looking to other things outside of God to bring satisfaction and contentment. But what did Jesus say? If you love me, if you truly love me, and you are devoted to me, and you're loyal to me, what does the Bible say you'll do? You'll keep my commandments. You'll obey me. And we see that betrayal in our lives, don't we? Do we keep the commandment of God? What's one of the first commandments? Thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall bow down to no graven image. And yet, see, see sometimes we want to bring that to this, you know, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a wooden statue in my house and I don't bow down. You know what an idol is? It's anything you put before God, anything that you rely on more than you rely on God. God wants us to be fully content and provided for by him. And how often... We compromise. We seek an alternative to him. Now I want you to know I'm convicted by that. I hope you are too because it's a healthy conviction. It should cause you to what? Examine yourself. To look into the mirror. You might not like what you see when you look at the truth. And for some people they can't see it. But I want you to know God can see what you can't see and what others can't see. God can see your heart. And it's revealed in the way you live your life. Does God have first place in your life, in every area of your life? Is he truly your God? And are you loyal and devoted to him? That is the question. So how do we win this war, this spiritual tug of war? Well, we have to protect our hearts from the pull of the world and our own fleshly desires. It starts with that. Protecting our hearts from the pull of the world on our fleshly desires. That is, is continual. Every, that's what commercialism is built on, is a commercial that says, you need this. You need this. You need this medication. You need this vacation. You need this alcoholic beverage. You need this lifestyle. You need this lustful sexual satisfaction that's what commercialism is all about and often it's it's described as sexy how appropriate but we've got to protect our hearts from that be be ready and i believe this message is 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 god challenging us to ask the question are you loyal are you devoted to me are you really in love am i the love of your life But this morning, I want you to sense this spiritual tug of war and, and ask, do you feel it? Are you guarding your heart and mind? Do you feel this, this tension? The minute we leave here, the world's going to tell us there's other things that are more important. This, this spiritual warfare is a battle for the mind. Satan is going to attack you and, and help you and try to get you to forget what you're going to be learning here this morning. That there's other things more important. No, I did church. That's over now. Listen, in the Christian life, church is never over <laughs> when you're in a relationship with God. You're communing with God every day of your life. You're in a love affair with God. Could I, would my wife accept a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday relationship? We're married. I love you Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, don't ask where I am on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday. But Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'm all in. And I'm going to give you the best of me. And you should be pleased with that. Any woman be satisfied that way? Well, I got, you know, he's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. He's unbelievably attentive to me. He pours himself out to me. You wouldn't believe it. Now, Thursday, I don't know who he's with or what he's doing. But, but I got three days a week and I'm, whew, I'm feeling good. Anyone be content that type of relationship? If you are, there's something wrong with you. There might be something now I have to ask, what are you doing on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? 
But listen to Proverbs 4.23. Keep, this is the idea, and some, some versions say, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. What is in our hearts will be seen in how we live and what we live for. What are you dreaming about? What are you dreaming about? Some are thinking about Sunday dinner. Hmm, can't wait. It's the day I let, let loose. <laughs> Some are thinking about the errands that got to run. Some are thinking, I hope the pastor doesn't go long this week. You know, you know how you can go on and on. <laughs> but what is in our hearts will be seen in how we live and what we live for. And you know what the goal is? Is to have Jesus at the center of your life and at the center of your heart that you're in a deep, abiding love relationship with him. I remember when I was dating my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time. I was working, but I was on the clouds. I was plumbing away, and I'm thinking of her. If I get this job done soon enough, I can get together, and we can talk and have coffee. And That was every day, every minute of every day. I was constantly, she was in my mind and on my heart. Why? Because I was in love with her. Now, every man's nightmare, and even some women's nightmare, is the person who says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Anyone ever have that happen to them? I remember it happened to me as a young man. I learned the difference between someone who loves you and someone who's in love with you. And I quickly learned that if I'm ever going to be in a relationship, again, I want to be in a relation in which that person is in love with me. Are you in love with God this morning? Is it hot and heavy in a sense? Are you thinking of him all the time? Are, are, are you living a life reflective of, he, he's, I'm breathing today because he makes it happen. I'm protected and I'm safe right now because he watches over me. I don't have any needs in my life because he provides for me. The challenge in the Bible is look at the birds. How many of you look at the birds on a regular basis? I, I was reminded yesterday, one of the girls gave a testimony, and she talked about, and, the most, and I've heard this so many times, and it's, it's, it, sh, it should be revealed to us. The Bible tells us to look at the birds for a reason. And often God uses birds as confirmation that he's on the scene, that he's going to take care of you. It's a wonderful signal from God that he's there and that everything's going to be just fine. But the challenge of the word of God is, look at the birds. They don't toil and reap. Your heavenly Father provides for them. How much more does God love you? If he provides for the birds, won't he provide for you? It's a rhetorical question. Of course he will. Of course he will. This girl gave a, a wonderful testimony of, this hardship in her life and she really needed to know that God was going to be there in her life and she's, she's going along and it's a winter day and a, and a cardinal flies by her car on, on the highway on a frigid cold day. She said, it was, I think she, her testimony was like 9 or 12 degrees outside and a cardinal flew, flew by. Now most of the cardinals I know in the winter are down south <laughs> if they're smart. But God brought this cardinal. He deployed him or her and said, I have a mission for you. I want this person to know I love them and I'm here for them. Go fly by that car for me. And obediently, the bird obeys to send a signal. I'm here. You're not alone. I love you. So, Jesus, in the word of God, speaks of, of Pharisees who had the outward appearance that they were in a love affair with God, but they really weren't inwardly. Their lips, they, he said, they speak of me, but their hearts are what? They're far from me. So we can be in jeopardy. We can talk the talk and walk the walk. We can fake it till we make it. But God knows what's going on inside of here. We've got to get real. We've got to self-examine ourselves. And is God first in my, in my life today? Is he number one? Each of us needs to ask that question this morning. I challenge the Revere Church in the same question. 
Is Jesus number one in your life? If you lost everything, but you still had him, would it be enough? Or would you be complaining? We have to ask ourselves this morning, is my heart in a line with God's heart? Do I know where God is going? And the bigger question is, am I following? Am I following in a love relationship with God? Am, am I obedient to him? Is he the, the compass of my life? The serious question to be asked this morning, is my heart divided? Is there a, a divided allegiance? That's James' warning in James 4.4 4, when he says, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be friend, a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy or in opposition of God. Here's the caution. Friendship with the world destroys a person's fellowship with God. I'll say it again. Friendship with the world in the world's ways, I'll go further to say, destroys a person's fellowship with God. The worst thing that can happen to a believer who's in a love relationship with God is to start to fancy and agree with an alternative way of solution that's outside of God. Yeah, I love God, but I need this too. What does that say to God? Are you ready? It's a hard truth. God, you're not enough. God, you're not enough. You can't provide for me what I need. You're good to a point, but I need this too. When we satisfy the lust of our flesh, the, our physical needs, our emotional needs, God, you're great, you're good. But when we choose things over him, we say, God, you're not enough. Is that true? Isn't the Bible tells us that God can provide for us over and above all we could ask or think? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? That is what the Bible teaches. So why do we need other things over him? Can he provide the food we need? Can't, we can't he provide the emotional protection we need? The medical help we need? Let me answer for you. Yes, he can, unequivocally. Yes, he can. Say it with me. Yes, he can. The Bible says a, a, a house divided cannot stand, against itself cannot stand. When we have a divided heart, we're weak. We're weakened to a spiritual strength that comes from God, knowing that God can provide for all of our needs, knowing that he can get us through the storm, Know it's, he can provide for us financially. Knowing that he can provide for us emotionally. He's enough. Isn't that the crisis in an adulterous relationship? That the one I'm with is not enough. I need something on the side. This relationship is inferior. It doesn't meet all my needs. So I need to supplement it with this. What a hurtful thing when we act this way with God. John, 1 John 2, 15, 16. Listen to this New King James Version. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. What consumed your thought life? Are we filtering the thoughts? Because often, that's Satan's whisper. You need more. You need something else. Sometimes when we feel empty, or thirsty, or hungry, the Bible says you're blessed. Do you know that? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for this is the kingdom of heaven. That's recognized 
the wantonness and the emptiness is God's warning light, warning signal. It's like that, that dummy light in the car that years ago that you didn't, it just a light went on. It says, you know, you're going to run out of gas. That signal may be going on in your heart right now. You feel empty. You feel confused. You feel fearful. That's a, that's a sign that there's something, there's, there's a flaw in your relationship with God. You don't fully know or have you committed your whole life to him. You don't have an experience or a remembrance that you couldn't be where you are or who you are today if he hadn't already been doing that. We all know this is true. I'm just reminding you. I'm reminding me. God has proven to us he is enough and that we don't need the things of the world. Spiritual adultery is a metaphor for spiritual unfaithfulness in our relationship with God. We should never forget that God is jealous for us. He's not interested in a fling. He's not interested in being one of many gods in your life. This spiritual adultery, it says something. It says, God, you're not enough. You don't do it for me. I need something more. One of the most powerful examples of God's devoted, loyal, unconditional love is found in the book of Hosea. Some of you know where I'm going. What a beautiful picture. And when God gives us pictures in the Bible, it's because he wants us to truly see. Often, somebody tries to explain something to me uh, with my work with plumbing, and, and I can't really decipher what they're trying to tell me. I tell them, send me a picture. When I get the picture, now I know exactly what's going on. Okay, you were calling a boiler a furnace, and that's not a thingamajig. That's a relief valve. <laughs> but they did the best they could to try to describe it. Not until I saw the picture did I understand really what was going on. And God wants us to really see what's going on. Listen to this. In your heart and in his heart. What a beautiful picture is seen of an adulterous wife, a harlot prostitute, who is unfaithful to her husband and a devoted husband who pursues her back to himself. That should sound familiar to you because that's you and me. We're going to learn about a woman named Gomer who God will lead Hosea to marry as a picture of a broken relationship God had with his people. She was an unfaithful wife, a disloyal wife. It's a metaphor for an adulterous people of Israel who continually went back to idolatry even though God had been faithful to them, had provided for them, had guided them, and never left them. They still went back to the pagan gods who offered them what? Nothing. Nothing. The one good thing about pagan gods is they never correct you because they can't. They're dead wooden images or stone images. They don't speak. You just ask them what you want. They never tell you what's wrong. That's love. How I know that? Because the Bible says God corrects the ones he loves. And he has a voice. And he speaks. And we've got to listen he sets up God reels in our lives. You know why? Because he doesn't want to make, want us to wreck our lives. He doesn't want us to go off the road and, and be destroyed. He puts God reels in our lives because he has a, a direction and a destiny and, and, a, and a final destination for us that is to be with him forever. He puts those God reels up because he loves us. Look at the story of Hosea in Hosea 1, 1 through 9. I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Barry. Now, mind you, Hosea is a prophet of God. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to him, now listen to this, go take for yourself a wife of prostitution and have children of her prostitution, for the land commits great acts of prostitution by not following the Lord. You know what God says? I want to show you what I go through with you. I want you to see what it is to love an unlovable people, an unfaithful people, a disloyal people, an undevoted people. 
So he went and took Gomer. I can't, when I hear the name Gomer, all I think of is Gomer Pyle. So I'm, I can't get, it's hard to get past that. The woman's name is Gomer, but that's what her name is. He went and took Gomer for the daughter of Debliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel. For yet a little while I will avenge the blood that, is, that was the shed blood in the valley of Jezreel and inflict the punishment for it on the house of Jehu. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of the military power of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then Gomer conceived again, and she gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, Name her lo meaning not shown mercy. For I have no longer have mercy on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. But I have mercy on the house of Judah and will rescue them by the Lord their God. It will not, and will not rescue them by bow, sword, war, horses, or horsemen. Now when Gomer had weaned Loharamah, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Loamai, meaning not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Can you hear the broken heart of God in these words? Can you hear the betrayal? When somebody offends you that you love, you become betwixt in a sense. There's a, there's a tension there. I love you, but you hurt me so bad. You broke my heart, and it hurts me so bad but I love you. Why do I love someone that hurts me? We can relate to that, can't we? But I want you to see something that's revealed in the scripture. We've gotten warnings. We've gotten a bit of conviction this morning. Now I want, you to show some, I want you to show something about God that you might not know that is so unbelievable and so incredible. Look at Hosea 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman, Gomer, who is beloved by her husband and yet is an adulteress. She has another love. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love the raisin cakes using the feast of pagan worship. So I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and a homer and a half of barley, the price of a common slave. What, what apparently has happened is Gomer has gone off and she's put herself in a, in a, in a uh, debt. And so she had to be, she put herself into slavery to, to pay back the debt, one that she couldn't overcome. And her husband sees and finds her. Now what could he say? Good, you're getting what you deserve. See you later. That's what he could say. But in this instance, Jose is representing the unconditional faithful love of God towards someone he loves, and that's we, his people. So listen to what happens. And he said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the prostitute, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be towards you until you have proven your faithfulness. Do you see this? Here, here Hosea represents the unconditional love of God. I will forgive the unforgivable. I will love the unlovable. You know, that's me and you in our relationship with God. When we don't put him first, when we seek other things to bring satisfaction in our lives, and we don't put him first. Now, I want you to be honest this morning. I want you to do that self-examination. It's us, isn't it? The scripture goes on to say, For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or a dollar's pillar, and without ephod or teraphim, household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return in deep repentance and seek the Lord their God and seek from the line of David their king, the king of kings, the Messiah, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness and blessing in the last days. You see what happens? And we've all 
I think, been there to some extent when we, when we lived out this adulterous relationship in which we had a fling with God, we had God on the side in a sense, but our real satisfaction, our flesh was being filled up by other things, worldly things, things of the flesh. And what did we find? We found the same thing that the nation Israel found when they went after idols and other gods. There was no blessing in it because they weren't real gods. They were left empty, frustrated, and wounded. And what did that bring? Repentance. Their minds were changed. You know what that's what repentance means? To change direction. To change the way you think. A lot of us had to get to that place where we, we, we thought that the man, or the medication, or the, or the lust, or the money, or, or, or the self-promotion, the, the advancement, that was going to fulfill us. I call it living the styrofoam life. Funny thing about popcorn, you could probably eat like a trash bag full. You don't get full. It just. I also call it the cotton candy relationship with God. But they come back to God, and they come back to a God with arms wide open. His arms are open. He's not like, oh, now you want me. You've had your fill, and you're empty, and you realize what the truth is, and now you think I'm going to take you back? Listen, this is what God says. I love you. How can I not? I love you. I've always loved you, even when you were away from me. I waited for you to come home. I waited for you to give me all of yourself. You found out that that won't fulfill you. All that do was hinder you. That will leave you empty. That will leave you broken. Sounds like the story of the prodigal son. He comes to himself as he's in the pig pen eating the hoofs of the, of the pigs. Pig food. And he's reminded, even in my father's house, the slaves have enough food to eat. I will go back to my father. And I will become as a slave. At least I'll have a roof over my head and plenty to eat. Even the lowest person in my father's house is provided for well. And when he comes home, what does he find? His father won't let him be a slave. He's an heir to his everything. And he restores him. Puts his robe on him. Puts his ring on him. Gives him full authority. Because the father's love never changes. Amen? The father's love never changes. He is loyal. He is devoted. He is faithful. The Bible is true. It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Tell me, did Gomer deserve her husband's love and forgiveness? Unfaithful Gomer? Was she a wife that you would want? Or a husband you would want? We're Gomer. And yet God still loves us. God's given us a look in the mirror so that we can see who we are this morning, but he also wants us to see who he is. And he's a God who's crazy in love with you, in spite of you. And he died for you because he would never let any chance that you wouldn't be able to be with him. He wouldn't let your sin separate you from him. Any good parent, good-willed, loving parent will tell you, I will always love my child no matter what they do or who they become. I want the best for them. I want them to have everything and I want them to obey everything I've ever taught them. But even if they go astray, I will always love them and hope that they'll return. That is the heart of God. Think about what we learned about God's love for his people. Now answer, who will the spiritual tug of war be won by in your heart? God has been so faithful. It's time for you and for me to give God all of us. No more God competing for our affection. No more God competing for our time. No more of God competing for our our heart and mind for him. I want to share this before I close. Eugene Patterson 
He wrote a book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And it offers, offers a picture of spiritual journey towards God. That journey can only begin with profound awareness of our need for something different. As Peterson puts it, a person has to be thoroughly, listen to this, disgusted with the way things are to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. One has to get fed up with the ways of the world before he, before she, acquires an appetite for the world of grace. Are you disgusted? Are you fed up with your divided heart? Do you want to give all of yourself to God? And truly live that devoted, loyal, love relationship with him? I know I do. Would you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much that we could come into the house of God this morning again and find a safe place to hear and meet with you. There's a great sense in my heart that you have renewed our hearts and minds. As we leave this place, please, Father, protect our minds. Would you captivate us and not let Satan rob this truth from us? May it fall on fertile hearts and take root and blossom and produce a changed life that we, we need, Lord. We need this sincere, unconditional, faithful relationship with you. Help us. Give us spiritual eyes to see the things in our lives that we've put between ourselves and you. Help us to do that inventory, Lord, and look for those things in our lives that have, have interfered in our relationship with you. Remove the division in our heart. Help us to have a single-minded heart towards you, totally devoted to you. Father, I pray for everyone here this morning, wherever this spiritual journey takes them today, whether they're in that place of devotion or in their place of disloyalty, I pray, Lord, that you would do the appropriate work in their lives. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the faithful who've come. For those who aren't here this morning, I pray that they might hear this message on the internet and that anyone who hears it might be transformed by it. Have your way in each of our hearts, Lord. For our lives are for you. To glorify you, not ourselves. We live for you and are in love with you. Help to make that real and true. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy this wonderful Sunday.